Welcome to Bruisers, a podcast about beer, coffee, booze, and bruisers. I'm your host, Rody John, and today we speak to Macaulay Williams with Alma Del Yaiwar Tequila. We talk all about how they got started, the fifth generation producers, and so much more. This is such a fun conversation. Uh, Alma Del Jaguar Tequila, or Yahuar, if you will. I'm not a good uh, Spanish speaker, so that one kind of uh, slips on me sometimes. But it is all about the Jaguar, and it is all about amazing tequila. They have such a fun story, and obviously how the Jaguar comes on as well. So, speaking of fun stories, make sure to sign up for our newsletter. You get even more information about our guests, you get fun facts, and you get to find out what's happening with your favorite podcast, all about beer, coffee, booze, and bruisers. So, without further ado, here is Macaulay Williams with Alma Del Yaiwar Tequila. Macaulay Williams with Alma Del Jaguar Tequila. How are you doing today, sir? Man, I'm doing well. Thanks. Thanks for coming on. Yeah, we kind of talked about this before we started here. Um, I was going to say, paint us a word picture where you're at, what's going on around you. Uh, but it is very icy. So, uh, yeah, tell us where you are and what's going on around you. Yeah, I'm, so I live and I'm from, born and raised in Memphis, Tennessee. And we've uh, been blessed this week with a lovely wintry mix of six inches of snow and one degree weather, and here in the south, we don't do too well with uh, snow and ice. No, no, we do not. My brother uh, lives up in Canada, and, he, you know, he grew up in Texas here, and he very much had to get used to that because we are not used to that cold on that long of a basis, and then also the snow. They actually have to, have to change their tires out for snow tires. It's, uh, yeah, it's a whole ordeal. And we like to remind people that, you know, the big difference isn't just because we're incapable, it's, but there's only one snowplow in our whole city, and right. you know, there's none of the salting of the roads, so it's not like there's any of the infrastructure here that the North yeah. has, right, <clears throat> for this kind of thing. But it's actually a pretty interesting segue into the genesis of our brand, uh, randomly enough, and it just kind of came to me. So um, our brand is uh, all about wild jaguar conservation. And that was inspired by my uncle, Rick Williams' life's work uh, in jaguar conservation. And so Rick was from here in Tennessee as well, and he moved out west to Driggs, Idaho, where he was a wildlife photographer and conservationist, photographing, you know, things like elk, moose, grizzly bear, wolf, the wolf reintroduction to Yellowstone, et cetera. And that's where he came across um, – a gentleman named Carlos Lopez, who was doing a presentation um, at a conference out there one one year about, you know, uh, jaguar sightings and studies in northern Mexico near the U.S. border. And he ended up going on an expedition with Carlos to northern Mexico to participate in the study and fell in love with it and moved there. And he cited one of his main reasons for moving to Sonora, Mexico, was because he wanted to get away from the cold winters of Driggs, Idaho. <laughs> yeah i've heard it gets very cold over there and uh you know idaho from what i've heard is actually a beautiful place to go visit and uh it i think it's an un um it's an untold gem really about you know places in america but i think they want to keep it that way and uh, not have what happened over in montana happen there well so yeah tell us more so how did did he come in contact because i'll Almadel's uh, tied together. How did how did it come about? <laughs> yeah, I mean, how, how did all that happen? Uh, yeah, how did everything come together after that? So anyway, so this was 30 years ago when he moved to Sonora, Mexico, and they ended up he and that uh, gentleman Carlos Lopez, who's a biologist and the leading biologist in Mexico on the subject of big cats, namely jaguars, ended up forming um, the Northern Jaguar Project which is a binational uh, nonprofit to study and protect the northernmost range of wild jaguars. Jaguars are actually native to the United States, and there's still sightings in, in southern Arizona today. But they founded, underneath that nonprofit, they founded the Northern Jaguar Reserve, which is the largest privately managed wildlife refuge in all of Mexico, and the home of the northernmost breeding ground of this beautiful a big cat. You know, jags are actually the third biggest cat in the world behind the lion and tiger. And they're the only big cat 
uh, that can roar here in the Americas. But anyways, uh, the backdrop is my uncle has been doing this my whole life, uh, effectively, since I was really little. And I always thought it was really cool. And I myself was an entrepreneur uh, who found my way into the spirit space. And uh, so I started off as a corporate attorney, ended up leaving the job uh, at the law firm to found a bourbon distillery here in Memphis called Blue Note Bourbon. Um, oh, yeah. Ended up ended up bringing up on you know, some partners that I did not um, end up getting along with in the long run. And I was actually forced out of my company in, 2000, in, in 2022, on January 7th, 2022. Uh, being forced out of the company you founded is, uh, and, and, and away from the brand you created is a weird feeling. But anyways, I was doing some soul searching. I wanted to stay in the spirit space. I wanted to, uh, I've been exploring tequilas kind of in my personal time. And then, um, a light bulb went off kind of in this time of reflection of, well, my uncle has been doing this amazing work in Mexico with Jaguars. I find myself getting more and more into tequila. Maybe my next venture should be tequila. And if I'm going to do it, let's do it right and build a brand that's all about something bigger than just seeking profit and uh, about, you know, a give back component and about conservation and sustainability. So I called Rick, my uncle, and said, hey, like, you know, here's what's going on. <clears throat> what if we did a tequila brand uh, all about raising money and awareness for what she's been doing with the Northern Jaguar Project and Wild Jaguar Conservation I think there's something there. Let's like explore that concept. And he loved the idea. And I booked a one-way ticket down to Guadalajara to Jalisco and lined up a bunch of meetings with tequila distilleries and had, had him join me um, uh, for the adventure. And we met with every tequila distillery that would see us until we ultimately uh, found the one that's now our production partner uh, on that journey. Yeah, so they are fifth-generation uh, tequila rows and they've been growing agave since 1929. How did you guys eventually uh, stumble upon them? Okay, so we knew we had – I had the concept together. And so my uncle's not really a partner in the brand. It's really just me, and my and I've now built a team. But he's he's the inspiration and genesis of the brand. And uh, so he's he's there. He comes with me on all, a lot of our trips to Jalisco. But um, with this concept in mind of con- Jaguar conservation, we knew we needed a – a uh, production partner that believed in sustainable uh, production methods, sustainable farming. You know, we couldn't um, rob Peter to pay Paul in the sense that we we couldn't partner with some industrial mega factory that was harming the environment in Jalisco just to give back a portion, a portion of our proceeds to save wild jaguars in another part of the country. That didn't make sense. And so we met with as many groups as we could and and then one stood out, which was the Vivanco family estate, Nalm 1414. Um, everything about their operation is different than the other distilleries we met with. You know, they really uh, are stewards of the land. And the way they speak about agave farming and tequila production is much more like the way a producer of fine wine speaks about the grapes, the soil, the terroir. Uh, and all of those steps than any, than any distiller I've met in the bourbon industry or, or in tequila. And, uh, we just had this magical meeting with, uh, Sergio Vivanco, who's kind of the family patriarch, if you will, and kind of the leader of the, of the group. And everything about that meeting, like I said, was different. We, he, he didn't talk about production volumes or price or numbers or, or anything like that. He just, we hopped in his truck and went out to the agave field and saw the field. And he started talking about his family's legacy, the, the land, the soil, how caring for the agave from when it's just a little bitty pup all the way through maturation, which takes about seven to eight years is going to be the most important part of making a good tequila. And they don't use any chemicals in their farming practices or in their production practices. And so we just really hit it off, man, and and fell in love with Mr. Vivanco, his family, their story, and their tequila. Their house tequila was excellent. And we kind of left after meeting with about 20 different groups, knowing that this was the group we really wanted to partner with because of their family values and kind of internal ethos matching ours. That's amazing. Yeah, I was in the the wine world for 14 years, and I know toward the end it was – uh, you heard more wineries talk about being 
more sustainable and focused on sustainability. And I didn't think about that when it came to the agave world or the tequila world. You know, how tell us more about that. How how important is that? Because not only are you giving back to the soil that's giving you your product, but you are, like you said, not using the chemicals and not making it more harmful for the for the ground and the, for the soil. So <clears throat> agave production and tequila production, mezcal production is kind of what we talk about mostly when we say agave production. There are a few other obscure versions of agave spirits, but um, it's just fundamentally different than other spirits. So if we just take a step back and think about whiskey, rum, cognac, uh, and tequila, we can quickly see some differences. So whiskeys are made from grain. So too are pretty much all vodkas, uh, gins, or grain-based distillates. Um, and then cognac is, of course, a grape-based distillate, and rum, you know, being a sugar or sugar cane-based distillate. Those plants are all fundamentally different than an agave plant. And if you look at kind of each one of them, there's some, there's some nuances, but they're just some really unique chemical properties of the agave plant and, uh, how, how it grows and everything. But I like to use whiskey as the, the base comparison is because that's where my, uh, my background is. Um, the grain source for most bourbons in the U.S. is just number two yellow corn, which is a commodity that is, you know, traded on commodity exchanges. And there's really little thought put into where the grain is coming from when you make bourbon because it's all about the barrel maturation. The barrel is where all the flavor comes from. But in an agave distillate, even though we use barrels in some of our aged expressions, it's really all about the exact plot of land that that plant came from. So there's two main classes emerging in the tequila world right now. They're sort of non-technical classes because there's a big debate as to the law on this, but in tequila, you can use chemical additives after you've right. distilled the liquid uh, to smooth it out. And those additives are things like glycerin, sugar, sweetener, aspartame, uh, coloring agents, etc. And, and we don't do that. We the group. So there's normal tequilas and there's additive-free tequilas that add no manipulants to it. And we fall in that additive-free category. And within that, there's nothing to hide behind. Like the taste of the tequila is going to be based on where that plant, that agave plant grew and how it was harvested, how it was cooked, milled, fermented, and all of that is, it's just infinitely more, I'm probably not doing a great job of describing it, but it's infinitely more nuanced <laughs> um, in the farming, harvest, cook, mill, fermentation process than a grain-based distillate. Um, and it's it, the closest relative to tequila production really is wine. And you hear in wineries how they will talk about, you know, the exact sun exposure, rainfall, soil content, all going to affect the grape and how it grows and the flavors that it contains. The same is true in agave. Um, and so, you know, our family, the Vivancos, are, are some of the best at doing this, but you know, there's varied topography on their ranch, so it's not all just flat. And if a agave grows on a, an incline, it's going to get less sunlight exposure uh, throughout the day, and the rainfall is going to be different, and it's going to stress the plant more, which actually brings out better flavor. Um, mm -hmm. But it's just it's just fascinating to see how nuanced the uh, the production process is. And then where the flavors come from in terms of like how that plant grew up itself. Yeah, because I saw that you guys were just you know you only use three ingredients: the agave, the water, and the yeast. And like you said, you guys are no added your tequila is additive free. And I know a lot of other. Uh, I mean, that's becoming more of a, a prominent thing in the tequila world of saying that you're additive free. Um, how important do you think that is to the tequila world? Because like you just said. There's so many people that can just add the extra flavor in at the end, but when you're getting it straight from, you know, all the way you're uh, growing the agave and the way everything's working together.